Hello, I'd like to welcome our virtual audience to the sixth Fearless Conversations event, a collaboration between the Advertiser and Flinders University. It's about being brave in our thinking about how we drive South Australia forward and challenge ourselves to position this great state for success in the future. We're about halfway through our series now and for each session we've assembled a team of thought-provoking leaders to explore their views on the opportunities and challenges that we face in relation to each topic. And today we explore the environment and sustainability and how it will influence SA now and in the future. Feel free to join the conversation through Twitter using the hashtag Fearless Conversations or in the comments section on advertiser.com.au. I am Claire Petty, the science journalist with The Advertiser focused on climate and environment, and I'll be facilitating today's discussion and encouraging guests to be brave as we talk about the environment and sustainability. Before I introduce today's panellists, I'd like to acknowledge that we are meeting on the traditional land of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage beliefs and relationship with their land. We acknowledge that we are they are of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today and also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations. Today we are joined by, and not in quite the same order, <laughs> <laughs> maybe I will do the order. We are joined by Laura Trotter, um, who's an environmental engineer and award-winning sustainability educator, um, by Ben Hurd, who's a consultant with Fraser Nash and a uh, focus on energy and then Professor Corey Bradshaw, Global Ecology Professor that is, at Flinders University. And finally, we have Kira Reznikoff, who is an environmental and planning lawyer with fin Finlayson's Lawyers. I get it right. So, welcome all. And first up, I wanted to ask to each of the panellists, on the subject of being fearless, how could we be brave and bold in our quest for sustainability? What's something we can do differently? Oh, that's an open-ended question. I actually <laughs> think, yeah, I think uh, there's two start. prongs of this. I think there's what we can be fearless as an individual and obviously what we, how we can be fearless as a society uh, you know, and, and a region, so Adelaide as well. So fearless as an individual, it's really to, um, it's all about um, having the courage to challenge, mm. having the courage to challenge our governments and our politicians to do better, having the courage to challenge our, our industry and our corporates, um, corporate companies to do better, but also having the courage to challenge ourselves and our sphere of influence, our friends and our families to do better when it comes to sustainability and make the changes that are going to make the difference in our, in our own lives and reduce our own impact. So I think that's one aspect of, uh, of individuals, but obviously, um, you know, being fearless as, as, um, as companies and organisations and universities and governments, we also have to have that courage to, to move forward in this journey, set, set the targets, move towards the targets, you know, being, being net zero or, you know, reducing biodiversity loss and protecting more native areas, having that courage and having that courage to do that sooner rather than later, stop putting things off. Okay, so, Ben, what do you think? Yeah, I think they're fantastic thoughts from Laura. I, I think that needing to be open to new ideas is very, very important. And we often feel really frightened of new ideas that might be challenging the way we've been thinking about a challenge for a long time. So we, we've got to be able to have very open and honest conversations about uh, what we've got in front of us. And I think another way that we need to be fearless is to really embrace the long term here. You know, I think that the we, we too often set aside the scale and the challenge and the real timeframes we're dealing with in, in tackling some of the, the big challenges we've got, but also the big opportunities that, that we've got. They don't normally come to fruition over five or 10 year horizons. They're more generational and, and even multi-generational. And so I think that we've got to be prepared to get on, um, dare I say, at a slightly less humble footing and think quite big about the, the challenges we've got with some, some very bold long-term visions of what the future can be and come backwards from there to where we are today and, and set that 
uh, as our as our boundary. So actually get quite excited about um, the future we can create, not just the future that we're desperately trying to avoid. Yeah. And you know, I think that 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 takes its own sort of courage to to, mm -hmm. to come out of that um, a frightened spot about the the concerns we have for the future, and instead go to okay, I've done that bit now. I've had my fear. I've had my grief in some respects mm -hmm. um, for for what I feel we're losing, and now I'm ready to think positively about about what I want to build. Uh, and I think that that takes courage, actually, yeah. and and we need to be fearless in in fearlessly optimistic. Can I can I perhaps put that out there? I think we need to be fearlessly optimistic. Nice, Corey. I often get uh, asked, or at least the sentiment gets forwarded. And you hear this in the news a lot, you know especially at the national level. Oh, Australia doesn't have a big footprint. doesn't matter what we do. Even if we were the top of the top of the pops kind of thing, we wouldn't still make much of a dent. Well, that's, un that's, that's backwards thinking because, um, it's, you know, S South Australia has really realized how lucky we are throughout the pandemic. We have come through this relatively unscathed. And part of that is because we have a small population, but we can shift things and we can control things very quickly. Whereas in more populated states and other parts of the world, that's a major impediment just because there's so many players. We have the opportunity to move the players around a little bit more freely. And so we can make bigger decisions. And it's not about our overall impact. Yes, that's going to help, but it's going to be showing people, yeah, you can do this. And we have the means to do that. We're a, we're a wealthy uh, nation in a, well, a wealthy state. We have a very good standard of living. We have freedom to move around and we have uh, all sorts of opportunities just waiting for us. We just have to make the leap. Yeah. A lot of people think South Australia is a little bit more staid, mm -hmm. um, but I think that's a, that I think the pandemic really shows us what's possible. Whereas it's, um, you know, the, the big, fast, shaking, moving uh, big cities around the world, you know, they've been really struck by their Imp uh, their, their impotence to move forward in a lot of these directions. We have that response. We have that capacity. Okay. And I think, I think building on, on what has, has just been said, for me, it's really about being willing to embrace change. You know, it's, I know it's even in my own personality to feel comfortable doing things the way that they've always been and, and keeping uh, c continuing with things that are safe um, and comfortable. Um, but really to be able to move forward, we have to accept that we're going to have to start doing things differently. And there will be some change. Uh, and as Ben said, there might be some short term inconvenience. There might be some short term cost, but we've got to embrace that change to really be able to move forward in a genuine way. All right. And, and notwithstanding all that, just to build on that again, is um, South Australia, we have a bit of a track record of being fearless in this space. Yeah. You know, we've got the first container deposit scheme in Australia. We were the first to um, ban the single use plastic bags and the first to ban um, single use plastics. You know, we got the first big battery. So South Australia has been fearless and brave and we're at a perfect place right now to just capitalise and continue to leverage from the successes that we've had to be a true leader and the global stage in sustainability. I agree. There's something nice about South mm -hmm. Australia that's uh, sometimes it's just the right size yeah. for some change. Mm -hmm. uh, not not always that easily, and sometimes we feel a bit small. Sometimes it, it's it slots through. We're just big enough for it to be meaningful. Yeah. We're just small enough that we can actually get everybody in a room together to make a bold decision mm -hmm. um, to, to move something forward. We're kind of like the New Zealand of Australia, though. <laughs> <laughs> New Zealand, but but I think but I think we can do more. And um, uh, there are there are some things ideas that have been kicking around in biodiversity and conservation in particular that I, that I think we, we should have enacted a long time ago where we could, we could really show some really impressive things mm -hmm. to the rest of the world. So I think we've got a lot more we can do. We can do. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And what do you think of the job prospects for the future, like in this sector, if there are students? And I will start with you, Laura. Yeah, but I, get, I get really excited <laughs> about this. You know, um, I graduated at, over 25 years ago. It was from the first environmental engin engineering course in Australia at RMIT University. So I was in the fourth, the fifth year of graduate. So when I was going into my undergrad, mm -hmm. the first grads were coming out and they were all snapped up. And I chose that course over marine biology at the time because I thought there's going to be more job prospects in this and I can work in different aspects of engineering, but have that environmental and sustainability slant. And throughout my entire career, I've never, um, I've never been out of work. There's always been more opportunities 
um, than I can take. And it's continuing to be that way and it's and I'm seeing it more and more. So for, um, for obviously graduates or students or the younger generation watching this now thinking, I wanna get into sustainability, um, where are the jobs? I can see them really being in three main areas. And this has always been the case, but the opportunities in these three areas continue to increase. So it's obviously the first, so I'll say the area. So the first is planning to do things right. The second is actually doing things right and managing the environment right. And the last one is fixing things up when things go wrong. So um, so under the planning, I see we've got, um, you know, a, um, circular economy space and designing zero waste regions and towns. We've got our climate risk um, assessments and plans, which I do a lot of work in for, for, um, for industry and also the defence sector. We've got setting up sustainability strategies and that ESG, so that environmental social government governments work in a lot of um, companies and governments as well. Environmental planning and approval, uh, um, legal. So obviously Kyra can talk to that. Um, uh, environmental impact statement work. So there's so much work in that planning space and actually looking at new developments, be it industry or towns, doing things right. Uh, obviously, the doing things right comes under our traditional environmental monitoring and environmental management, but it also goes into carbon accounting and decarbonisation, looking to transition our current industries into the cleaner industries that we are going to need now and into the future. Um, there's also... Um, yeah, stakeholder engagement and indigenous relations. You know, you don't need to be a scientist or an engineer to work in sustainability and environmental uh, management. You can work in the stakeholder and communications aspects or the legal aspects or even the finance aspects, sustainable finance. And of course, there's probably what was the first jobs in the environmental sector were in um, contamination assessment and remediation, which is fixing up things fixing up land and groundwater and air and cleaning things up when things go wrong. And those jobs are just not gonna go away. And of course, new technologies are coming in, the digital technologies, um, all the renewable technologies um, and, and switching to, to cleaner fuels. So, so if you're you know, a computer scientist with mathematics, but with a bit of a green slant, there's lots of opportunities with your technology there as well. So I think that I think it's a really interesting time and a very exciting time to be heading into sustainability. You can basically pick any stream and any mm. any topics and talents and you know follow your passion and um, create a new job. <laughs> I'd imagine there'd be lots of work for lawyers too. Kira, what do you think? <laughs> I think I think there always is going to be work for lawyers and and certainly for me um, the area that I work in which is sort of project approvals and and environmental um, ass assessments for um, sort of major projects. We are seeing projects that are coming into South Australia where we haven't done that kind of thing before. You know, we are bringing new technologies in. I'm looking at, you know, a number of ideas at the moment about bringing hydrogen um, into South Australia. And obviously our legal system was written um, at a time when we hadn't ever contemplated doing something like that, managing plants that are going to look and work that way, putting hydrogen into our pipelines and that sort of thing. Yep. So there's always going to be a need to be sort of bringing law up to speed with the way that society's um, changing and, and technology is changing. Mm -hmm. And then helping um, sort of the, our regulators, our stakeholders, our community to understand what it is that we're doing and how we can do it in an appropriate way and then make our legal system um, sort of work around that. I agree with that. And following on from, from what Laura said, as someone who actually did a master's in, literally a master's in corporate sustainability, mm -hmm. I sort of now come back and look at that and go, there, there is no job that itself is the sustainability job. Like there's, mm -hmm. there's no hero job out there that's the sustainability gig. We're all doing it. Mm -hmm. It's about what companies, organizations, universities, government, society, community as a whole. You mean the marketeers aren't real? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's, it's the collective effort that we're making means um, do, do whatever you're great at and pursue these goals and values and you're going to find that great job there. So, you know, we... You know, we're a systems engineering and technology company. We are hiring. We do a lot in, for example, really intelligent asset management. Now, as we need to sort of remake entire systems of, of poles and wires and um, pipelines and assets, and we need to get more out of less all the time. We are using all of our knowledge, all of our intelligence, um, applying artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, all of the data. Um, there's more data coming than ever before, which is helping us learn more about the, the the systems we've built around us to make them last longer, perform better, deliver more, to help us get to, to, to where we're going. 
So these opportunities are, are absolutely out there. So, you know, we as a company um, take a very deliberate effort to pursue those really interesting opportunities that are really in line with our values. Mm -hmm. and, and those opportunities are, are across the board. Um, mm -hmm. we, we've got to sort of create those grand societal projects and you'll find very differently qualified people are going to be needed to, to move these great projects um, forward. And then we're all working in sustainability, which is, and that's when you know you're winning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As a society is when, is when we're all working on, that, yeah. on those, uh, those, those grand goals. Mm -hmm. yeah. Gone are the days when it was just the responsibility of the environmental scientist or the environmental advisor in an right. organisation. So obviously at GHD, we've, you know, engineers from all walks of life, but it's the civil engineer, the structural engineer, the transportation engineer, the mining engineer, the process engineer, they, the building, Green's building engineer, they all have to be across sustainability in their designs mm -hmm. to, um, mm -hmm. you know, because each, each code, every in area and sector of society has their own sustainability guidelines that you need to meet as well these days. So mm -hmm. yeah, I'll throw out one big specific area, which is mm -hmm. what I'd call mobilizing energy. So uh, if we go to net zero being sort of beyond power and all the way through transportation fuels and all the way through all of the other fuels, sort of fundamentally until now, we've been benefiting from hundreds of millions of years of slow chemistry done by the earth for us to make this stuff to about 85% of what we need. And then we just do the last bit and then we've got our fuel. We're now gonna start moving to the point where we're doing all of that chemistry just about in real time to serve that whole economy. It's a massive transformation. So whatever, and I know Kira, you're a chem -eng, I think, mm -hmm, uh, I by origin, <laughs> right. So chemistry, chemical engineering, and being able to sort of create and mobilize and move energy from root clean energy sources, that is going to be enormous. It needs to be enormous to get to net zero. There's no other way. Yeah, so society is a complex adaptive system. And just what basically all of the panelists have been saying, every element of society has to work together because there is no one lever we can pull. We have to pull them all simultaneously. And I often say to my students, you know, in, in the biology side of things or, the, you know, broader environment, we kind of know already the major phenomena. What we need now is more behavior intervention, society psychology. We need agricultural um, innovation, not, not just technological, but just the planning side of things. Change management. Yeah, exactly. Um, democracy, political science, how we can remove the corporate stranglehold on our so-called democracies, which, you know, no country can boast having a pure democracy. We all have shades of a plutocracy. You know, these are, these are things that people don't actually think about in terms of sustainability, but they're all connected to this system. How we manage our water, which is a massive problem in Australia, you know, all the rorting with the Murray Darling alone, we see massive problems and that just cascades through the environment and, and affects us, especially those poor sods at the bottom of the river. <laughs> uh, and it, it goes into everything to, to obviously energy, green chemistry, green engineering, green steel. You know, these are major educational transformations as well. We have to change how we teach people within very specialized disciplines that they actually are embedded within a complex adaptive system that every choice that they make affects the others. And so our education needs to be transformed as well. And we're getting there slowly, but we, we, I think because of the need to specialize in our education, because there's so much information to process, mm -hmm. that we've lost that interconnectivity mm -hmm. and that multidisciplinarity that we need to make mm -hmm. these bigger decisions. Mm -hmm. Now I'm working with chemists, I'm working with political scientists, I'm working with economists, I'm working with psychologists. The, the, you know, to, to embrace the bigger, what do we do? You can't just pull one lever. Mm -hmm. And I don't have the expertise to be able to say, well, you know, this is what you do in psychology. So I have to get my very mm -hmm. uh, learned colleagues to help me do that. It's, it's a multidisciplinary approach. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. a team effort. Absolutely. So, Ben, you were talking about the road to net zero. Are there signposts along the way to tell us whether we, we're on the right path? Are there things we need to look out for to know? Well, look, absolutely. <laughs> I like I like net zero a lot as a term because it takes the excuse making away fundamentally. Um, I've seen critics of net zero say that oh, this is going to become another excuse for buck passing and offset. So they're, they're focusing on the net. My experience with um, the stakeholders that we're working with is actually it's put, it's created a hard focus on the zero. So I'm seeing a lot of large, really powerfully large corporates realizing we've got to get 
more and more our processes down to a zero. Mm -hmm. And you can multiply zero as many times as you like and it's still zero. That's the beauty, that's the beauty of it. So uh, the, the signposts are actually pretty simple. The emissions have to be going down. If they're not going down, we're not winning. And a, offsetting has a very limited future in that because eventually the whole world needs to do it and you run out of places to, places to hide. So I think, I think the major signpost will be uh, electricity just needs to be solved. Um, and we have to stop making it artificially hard. So um, a clean electricity system is not difficult. Australia is making it as difficult as it can <laughs> by only choosing some technologies and not all technologies. That part of it has already been amply proven elsewhere. I think we really know we're winning when that is comprehensively on its way to being solved based on the evidence we've got of using both nuclear fission and renew renewable technologies. When a big shift in the focus goes to, uh, I've mentioned it before, displacing oil is going to be much harder than displacing coal from electricity. Mm -hmm. We're focusing far too much time and effort on the easiest part of the challenge that we should just be getting on with and doing. Mm -hmm. Displacing gas is going to be far harder than displacing coal from electricity because technologically it's more challenging. It's a more useful, versatile fuel in the world economy mm -hmm. than coal. Coal and electricity is very, very directly and easily substituted with uranium and, and the carbon is gone. You, you blend the uranium and the, and the renewables and some storage and you optimize the system, it's solved. That's not, it's not simple, but it's not a riddle, right? We, we absolutely know how to do that. Mm -hmm. There are some things along the way we genuinely don't know how to do. So I will feel heartened when a lot of the effort and focus is switching to, to those difficult to decarbonize sectors. Mm. Industry, steel, cement, thank goodness we're seeing some of that fo focus emerging now, but we're wasting too much time on the elect electric sector. Yeah, We need to get into... The, the transport fuels, yeah. the industrial processes, uh, and particularly the land use and the land care as well. And construction. Construction. Abs and oh. the cements, yeah. And the yes, cement. absolutely. Yeah. That, th th those materials, that's when I feel like we're, we're winning. It's when, um, a little bit like, uh, yeah, I feel like we were at the stage of, of uh, cutting motor vehicle accidents when we, we decided to introduce seatbelts, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Whereas now we're way down, way down the path of interventions to keep on bringing down motor vehicle fatalities. And it works, by the way. It's astonishing how fewer people die on, on Australian roads than did when I was born, for example. Um, in terms of the, the, the level of our inter interventions, I feel we're way back up here trying to deal with the, the really obvious stuff. Mm. I'll feel heartened when we've, we've got that locked in because we've opened up to all of the technology. We're building all of the technology and we need and then we're going after the hard stuff. Any other signposts on that path that you want to? Well, very much like emissions, you know, our, our biodiversity measures are all spiraling downwards. Mm -hmm. There isn't a single biodiversity metric, at least at the scale of, say, the state or nationally, that we're doing well in. So we're still losing species faster than, than uh, we should be. We're still deforesting. Uh, we still don't have legislation that is actually has any teeth to stop illegal clearing. There's a, there's a, you know, in a lot of cases, a, a landowner, uh, if they are caught de, uh, deforesting or clearing their land, and that's a big if, because often the monitoring isn't there. Um, and if they are fined, the fines are so small that it makes more sense to put cattle on the, on the and, and sort of cut that loss and get the long-term profits. We don't have a system with enough legislative bite to, to offset that. Now, the other problem is that we have legislation here in South Australia that can bypass our uh, Native uh, Vegetation Act. If a politician decides that something is a major development, then the Native uh, Vegetation Council is bypassed entirely. You know, we, have, we can fix these little loopholes in the laws quite easily. We also invest less than 1% of our state budget in anything to do with environment. Mm. Yet we have these massive environmental problems. Now, um, unfortunately, we're going to have to you know, sequester a much larger proportion of that budget towards all aspects of this, uh, what we call sustainability. Uh, so th there's some easy fixes, um, but it just takes a little bit of uh, political bravery and, and now in, in, in on the part of the voting public that we need to push for these kinds of legis legislative changes. Do you have any thoughts about tree loss and legislative change where we, or is that not? Look, I think it's always, and I completely take your point, Corey, I think it's always the difficulty of, of the balance. 
in that, you know, we were talking about the need to make change and, and the, meet, the need to be embracing technologies. At the same time, we all recognise that we need to have development. We need to be, um, you know, building mines that are not just going to give us the, the steel and the copper, but also are going to give the lithium that we need to make, you know, batteries and, and smartphones and, and all of these new technologies and, and control sort of the smart meters that we need um, to kind of run um, a grid at um, net zero. And so the, the difficulty is always going to be, how do you balance opening up land for development and a use that we really need to be able to make these step changes forward with dealing with biodiversity um, and biodiversity loss and, and managing sort of the environmental impacts um, and that sort of thing. And look, it's, it's a tricky thing um, to do, but I agree that, that sort of resources do need to be put into trying to make that balance work. And I think a lot of people need to realize too that, you know, we, we have, uh, the concept of offsetting is pretty clear, you know, in terms of carbon, what Ben was saying, I mean, we're kind of running out of options, but you know, you, you emit some here and you sequester some there, and then you get this, that's the idea is you Basically get a net works. zero. Yeah. Um, we need probably to push more to negative, but that's another story. Biodiversity offsets are, are basically um, modeled off of that, where they say, okay, well, we're going to clear some bush over here and then we'll plant some more over here. Uh, unfortunately, most forests in Australia take between 300 and 1,000 years to gain the similar function mm -hmm. from nothing. So if you were to plant the trees, and even if you could plant all the different diversity of species that you'd need, the understory, the major, the major tree species, all the shrubs and everything else, and the, and the, and the forbs and everything else in the, on the forest floor, you wouldn't get a fully functioning, and what I mean by functioning is shelter for everything from the smallest soil invertebrates right up to birds and mammals, mm -hmm. uh, as well as carbon sequestration, what it does to the water table hydrology, mm -hmm. what it does to oxygen production. So all of these elements, what we call ecosystem functioning, don't come back and sometimes never come back. If once you raise a forest, even if you had the best, and we're far from even getting close to the best <laughs> ways to restore. We don't even have the science behind that yet for most systems. But let's just say you did, you would still have, again, centuries before you'd get the kind of biodiversity and ecosystem services value that we have today. So biodiversity offsets don't work, no matter how good your system is set up. So we have to get away from this uh, concept that we can build and develop and destroy here, and then just do a bit of planting over here and she will be right. That's that's uh, a complete fallacy. Mm -hmm. So instead, yes, we need to continue to restore. Yes, we need to do that on a massive scale, but we also have to think about our development and putting it into places that are either previously disturbed and mm -hmm. unlikely to come into any sort of natural state in any anytime soon. And, and, and smarter more, for example, intensification of agriculture as opposed to expansion. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it's the land sparing, land sharing agreements. And mm -hmm. I would point out that's gotta be part of the whole net zero picture as well. As much as yeah. climate change is probably the main focus I have, mm -hmm. there is some risk that climate change and net zero actually steals a little bit of oxygen from other really important environmental conservation, biodiversity, sustainability Quite issues. Quite literally. Yeah. <laughs> that, that Photosynthesis. Are, yeah, anyway. that are happening on different timescales. I mean, it might, you know, if we can get to net zero by 2050 in our energy system, that'll be a great effort. But that is, that's a, a long time yeah. to also, at the same time, be trashing forests, trashing reefs, doing a lot of other really bad stuff that we won't then recover. That are from. irreversible. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that are irreversible. It's, it's actually, as a, a sort of optimistic futurist, it's probably going to be easier to one day in future do a, a technological drawdown of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere than it is to, re to replace this biodiversity. Mm -hmm. So we've got to take more care with that. And our road to net zero, I think we've got to be, and it is one reason why I am quite passionate about nuclear technologies, because they are dense. It is a small footprint. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, I get very uncomfortable where I see very flippant trade-offs uh, of, well, just because it's creating zero carbon energy, every other concern is, is dismissed. We can clear that land to build, to build that farm. I go, gee, I'm not that comfortable with that trade-off mm. because we can't get it back that easily. Are we making the best decisions in this direction to 
to support the values we're trying to protect. I mean, if, if we're trying to deal with net zero to s supposedly support this, this natural world around us, it doesn't make sense to destroy it in the name of doing that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've got to balance those things out really carefully and really look after the, the, the nature around us as we achieve this, this transitional system. Yeah, once species are gone, they're gone. They're gone. Yeah. And despite what some genetics companies might want to tell you about bringing back <laughs> mammoths, um, you know, if there's no place to put the species back, even if we could generate bio, uh, genetic diversity in a population that's now extinct, which is beyond our technology and probably always will be, um, we're not going to solve the biodiversity crisis by creating mammoths. Uh, no. Once it's gone, it's gone. Laura, did you want to add? Yeah, I, I do want to add a couple of things. So obviously the, the core message coming out of the panel is that we can't just can't just be focusing on climate. We've got to be tackling all these other things at the same time. Mm -hmm. But you talked about was it gateposts along the way or signposts along sign posts on the road? To so obviously we've we've got our gateposts. You know the IPCC reports. The science is out there and clear. We we have to be net zero by twenty fifty, and we need to be halfway there by twenty thirty. So what less than nine years away, and. Um, that's to limit our global warming to um, one and a half degrees Celsius. Now there's areas in Australia already that have warmed um, at that amount, if not more. So, mm. and we need to definitely keep it um, below two degrees Celsius um, globally. Otherwise we're gonna have catastrophic collapse of ecosystems. So we need to be doing all these things at the same time. But of course, we, we it's so critical that we limit those emissions to, um, to keep under those thresholds Otherwise, we will have catastrophic collapse. And I'm all for regeneration, but we have to be mindful that we need to, we don't want to be regenerating land only to hit those temperatures and have um, so many more bushfires just wiping out that forest at catastrophic temperatures and, and things like that. So it, it all needs to be done quickly, sadly. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, maybe it's exciting as well. Would you? Oh, it's the best time, time to be in the field. Got... It's the most challenging and... Um, you know, the problems are there to be solved and it needs the brightest mind. So there's mm. there's lots of opportunities, um, but the urgency is very real. Yeah. Do you think people appreciate what it means to have loss of biodiversity? Is there a, is there a tipping? Like... No, well, <laughs> wow. <laughs> climate change is at the forefront of people. even a, del a denialist mind mm -hmm. these days. Uh, and unfortunately, the press hasn't been quite as um, focused on biodiversity loss. I mean, some sectors, yes. Uh, if most people realize to what extent we are losing species, oh, a, a couple of quick facts. We're losing species roughly at a thousand times the background rate of extinctions that happens between the mass extinction events. The last great mass extinction event was when big bolide, big uh, media hit the, mm -hmm. what's now Mexico and created the Chicxulub crater and made the non-avian dinosaurs go extinct. Of course, we still have dinosaurs, we just call them chickens now, mm -hmm. um, and other birds, right? Yeah. Uh, massive uh, mass extinction. Mass extinction is, de is defined as at least 75% loss of species within about 3 million years. Now, 3 million years is a long time, <laughs> mm -hmm. but geologically, it's actually quite a short period. Mm -hmm. Right now, while we haven't yet lost 75% of species that were here, say, back at the onset of the Holocene about, you know, 12,000 years ago, 50 or 14,000 years ago. Um, we're very much on track to reach that within a couple of centuries, not a couple of million years. So we are in the middle of what we call the Anthropocene, which is the sixth mass extinction event. Now, <laughs> when your species start declining, and we, you know, we, since the 1970s, we've lost 68% of the number of individual vertebrates in populations around the planet. So that means take any population of any vertebrate, when I'm saying a vertebrate, I mean, of course, I mean fish, mammals, reptiles, um, and uh, birds, amphibians. 70% mm -hmm. of the individuals in any given population on average are now gone. Now that's the precursor to extinction. Mm -hmm. So as populations dwindle, they become susceptible to all sorts of random events. So we're seeing this, this is across, we're losing insects now. Insects have a, a very rapid regeneration rate because, you know, they produce thousands of eggs per female and they, you know, they develop really quickly. You know, a generation length of a bee is three weeks kind of thing. A mosquito can be two weeks, but we're still seeing massive declines in insects and they make up um, some of the highest animal biomass on the planet. Right now, 
the, the high, if you take all vertebrates, we'll forget invertebrates for a moment, the highest number of, if you take, sort of add up all the meat on the planet, if you will, the, the biggest group is cows. The second biggest group is people. And we've dwindled our native wildlife to such a point where we've just take, sucked all that productivity out of the ground and turned it into cows and, and people. Mm -hmm. And all of the things that we depend on, our food, our air, our water, uh, our protection from bushfires is all dwindling. Mm -hmm. And you add that to the, the, the direct effects of climate change like heat deaths or floods or massive storms. And you get into a situation where our resilience is just spiraling downwards. See, I'm, not, I'm less sure about that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and Corey and I sort of have, have had these debates over a few years <laughs> in various forms. Um, he's right over, over a, a given time frame. But the, the irony of the, the whole rub of that is that um, since the 1970s to today, 2021, humans have never been in better shape. So at the same time as all that, that's happened, humans on average live longer, we're more literate, we're more vaccinated, there are, there are more people living in democratic societies, um, science is going better, food security has never been better, we don't see the mass famines anymore. We might see them sweep back in later if all of this gets right out of control. But most people on the planet are doing good. They're doing better than they've been doing before, better than they were doing in the 80s, better than they were doing in the 70s. Mm -hmm. So I feel that we, we will almost always have an affiliation for charismatic species, blue whales, tigers, um, you know, quolls. Don't forget uh, the koala. <laughs> the koala, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I'm not sure how attached we'll ever get to the idea that we need the biodiversity around us mm -hmm. because we, over this period, we've been very good at proving maybe we don't, maybe we can liquidate it mm -hmm. and and derive this enormous benefit, which we see in the data. I'm in, more inclined to think we have to want it. We have to want it for its own beauty, its own value in being in the world around us mm -hmm. to, uh, and which is what the Endangered Species Act of the United States was, was all about. It, it wasn't that you know, we need that species because uh, um, it's providing us this vital service. It was we need the species because we need it, mm -hmm. because it belongs. And, and if it gets endangered, we will act. Um, so, I know Corey's right. I know it happens over a different time frame. I'm much less certain that it will ever motivate humans so long as humans actually on the ground yeah. are doing pretty well uh, out of the deal. Yeah, but at, we, at the same time that you're, you're right, that we are living better and longer and that sort of thing, we're running on a, uh, a bank account that's going into, into the red. I do uh, agree. We, we yeah, have our credit the, cards the, maxed out. The, the, <laughs> well, not just that, it's the ecological footprint. Uh, we're using on average yeah. 1.6 Earths per year in terms of our renewable capacity. So, you know, it's like a bank account. I always use this analogy. You put you put $1,000 in every year, but you need 1,500 to live. Now you might have the savings are there, say, you know, a couple 10,000s. So you can keep doing that for a while and you can live high on the hog, but at some point you're gonna go bankrupt. And we're very close to that point now, if not have passed it in many respects, depending on the metrics you use. Yeah, and, and you know, in the thesis that you helped me write, and, and, I've, and I've mentioned this in, in, <laughs> yeah, in interviews before, I, that for me is the energy paradox. Yeah. The, the, the energy that's driven our prosperity and our well, well-being is, is now driving these countervailing risks. How the hell do we, t t do we um, disentangle these two things? Um, yeah. we, we aren't gonna be able to retreat from the energy without creating um, grave problems in, in, for billions of people in the world around us, but we cannot keep using the same amount of energy in the same, same way. Um, that's again, for me, nuclear fission, critical part of that. It can, it can break that paradox in partnership with, with renewables. Mm -hmm. um, but this is really um, a real tightrope that we're gonna be walking this century. Again, so I think you've gotta be fiercely optimistic about that because attacking that challenge um, from, from any other point of view is, is, gonna, be, is gonna be hard work. We can see that you're pro-nuclear. Yes. <laughs> I want to know if everyone on the panel, where do you sit with that idea or where well, just for our state? I'm not anti-nuclear. I mean, I worked at a, a, a copper uranium mine for four years, uh, Olympic Dam, so I was a senior environmental engineer there. Um, I think there is a place, there's definitely a place in our, in our energy cycle for sure. Um, of course, every, every solution has its pros and cons. And, and obviously the big issue around nuclear is, is the management of waste, um, mm -hmm. be, it, be it tailings or um, spent, spent fuel rods or whatever it might be. So, um, of course, but there's, there's countries in the world that are and have done it successfully 
for a very long time as well. So I'm definitely not anti-nuclear. I remember um, picking grapes in the Loire Valley of France next to a reactor cooling um, tower and thinking, well, the first thing I think of in France is wine and cheese. It certainly isn't mm. nuclear power. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. that, I'm absolutely, I think, honestly, without fission, we're, we have no chance of making any of the, the caps that we are intending to hit for the future of reductions in emissions and, mm -hmm. and temperature limitations. But it, the mix is regionally dependent. I mean, He's I defer to my yeah. expert mm -hmm. colleague here, but mm -hmm. I'm, I've been, I'm, in fact, I, I, I organized a, a letter um, by conservation biologists from around the world supporting the fact that without fission and that small footprint with high energy density, we're not going to solve the problems. I mean, if, if we just look at uh, so-called renewable energy of dams, the amount of damage that's done around the planet is unbelievable. Mm. It's um, and if you you think what they've done in China, the Three Gorges Dam, or what they're doing in the Amazon, the the biodiversity impacts of these kinds of facilities are horrendous, and we could get around that very quickly. Yes, there are disadvantages, but the advantages far outweigh the disadvantages, in my point of view. And Kira. I certainly think it's something that should be explored. Um, it should be fearlessly discussed. Uh, and I suppose from my background as a, as a lawyer, I know that we've got some laws in place at the moment that are effectively designed to shut down that conversation and stop us from even looking at it. And that really disappoints me. Um, and it, it was, I suppose, some, politi some politics um, that got in the way of some smart decision making. Um, I think it's historical. And I think, again, we need some brave souls um, at parliamentary level to be letting us have that conversation. Um, and once we've had that conversation and we've looked in it and at it and we have brought the community with us because social license is obviously a really important thing. It's essential. And, and we need the community to know and understand. And I think there's um, some responsibility both um, within our universities um, to have academics who are going to be putting themselves out there and having conversations with the community and helping the community to understand the science um, and the risk and the management techniques that we're using. And um, I think there's also a responsibility for media. Media needs to be um, normalising these conversations as well and, and using the power of its influence to actually inform and educate um, and get people to engage on these kind of topics. Can you summarise quickly what the impediments are that the laws that were well at, um, at the moment for instance um we've got laws that um that simply say we cannot um, build a nuclear generation facility in australia mm -hmm. um, we've got south australian laws that also um, say that we can't even put money um, into um, doing research and and um, uh, sort of um uh, assessment and planning um, for having nuclear facilities do we um, still have the three mines policy is that still current? Well, that, 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 that was never law. That, yeah. well, that was sort of a, a political policy. But yeah, I said within political parties and political parties are the ones who, I suppose, determine what law gets made and what law gets amended until we've got our politicians who are stepping up and saying, let's strip away the barriers and let's have a conversation and, and make some informed decisions rather than simply saying, we don't want to talk about it at all. Australia's not ready. Yeah. I say Australia's ready. Under the EPBC, Act, the federal minister, Environment, Environmental Protection, Protection and Biodiversity, Biodiversity Conservation Act. Ironically, <laughs> the minister has no pathway to approve a nuclear power plant. The, mm -hmm. the specific wording is the minister must not approve one of four actions, mm -hmm. and they're all nuclear actions, and one of them is a nuclear power plant. Mm -hmm. So what that means is that under the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation legislation, no matter how good the argument is that You're this not development yep. would be good for the environment and protection of biodiversity conservation there is no path to approve it. So you could put up the worst power proposal imaginable, and it might not get approved, but the minister could at least think about it, mm. um, could, could, could at least consider it. Uh, a nuclear um, uh, sol solution, even one you know, designed in, in the 21st century for 21st century needs using all of the new knowledge and technology has <coughs> no pathway for consideration. Uh, so that's, that's, that's an entirely suppressed conversation. What are the other acts that it's mentioned in? The RPANS Act, which yeah. is the regula Regulatory Act, which, yeah. and it was really picked up out of the RPANS Act when Australia was creating its new research reactor, which is a terrific reactor, mm -hmm. um, and really the wording was put down again. You could somewhat justify it in the RPANS Act. What was tr trying to say is that by creating this regulatory se sector, mm -hmm. we aren't by proxy um, changing policy on nuclear power. Yeah. What actually en we ended up doing was hard prohibiting it mm -hmm. in 
ironically, our environmental um, biodiversity conservation yeah. legislation. That's a fairly troubling circumstance mm -hmm. because it, um, I think Kira hit the nail mm -hmm. on the head. It, it just suppresses that conversation. Mm. Um, no business case investigation happens um, in, in the Australian setting because yeah, those, it's a losing battle. Yeah. 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 So that would be. Yeah. A, Will the change. nuclear subs change any of that? <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have to. We're going to have to service question. them. Well, um, I think a, a correct and true statement is that Australia will be establishing more knowledge, capability, skills, um, uh, skilled people, and skilled operators. Um, for which we'll need more training. Yes, for which we'll need more training, um, no matter what. So universities take note. <laughs> yeah, we, we, the, the distance from where we are to being able to effectively run nuclear power with Australian knowledge um, shortens inevitably. So that that that's true. Um, but there is still a difference, and I genuinely believe they're very different decisions. But the the, the, the commonality, in my opinion, should be. Is it a fit for purpose technology for the challenges we've got in front of us? Yeah. We've decided that for the means of purpose, pushing very large boats in the water, it, it absolutely is. Or well, making medical supplies. Or making medical mm -hmm. supplies. Yeah. It is. Well, is it, a, is it a fit for purpose technology for addressing our environmental challenges? We, we should have the same conversation. The overwhelming evidence is it, it, it is. Mm -hmm. yeah. And obviously some of the green solutions that we're moving strongly forward at the moment, like take up lots of land space. So the wind farms and and solar farms, and obviously we've already spoken about the dams and the impact that they have well, on rivers and biodiversity. Offshore renewable energy. Offshore renewable energy. Sure. So there's, and there's obviously- They're not it, perfect solutions. They're, they're not perfect. They still have their impact. Mm. Yeah, and being pro-fission doesn't mean you're anti-renewable. No. Uh, renewable. That's it. Exactly. All, all these options need yeah. to be on the table. We're saying it, it needs to be- uh, yeah. On the table for South Australia, like seems like we've got our electricity Why not? We've got sorted. the largest- Oh, we don't have our electricity sorted. No. No? Hey, tell us about our emissions. <laughs> <laughs> well, South Australia is a little bit like uh, Denmark in that we're a small region appended to a much bigger one. Mm -hmm. um, South Australia did something very clever, which was move fast and early on renewables. And in so doing, yeah. we've very effectively been able to use the, the remainder of Australia as like a big battery to, to move an energy in and out. Um, but where does most of that energy come from? Uh, the energy that's coming back the other way is coal, is coal fire powered. So if the if the if that way of doing energy moves around the east coast and it's now beginning to, the, those challenges grow in a in a what I would say a nonlinear way. They get harder faster. We go up a up a curve of, of complexity. So you know the challenge for integrating more renewable energy into South Australia now is we're actually needing to come up with new sources of demand, which mm -hmm. I find ironic. We we are for, for for generations of sustainability we've told use less energy efficiency. <laughs> we're now needing to come up with places to put cheap uh, energy in the middle of the day that doesn't have any, anywhere else to go. Um, mm. This is difficult. So there's a place for these energy sources, but the idea that we are going to achieve, as, as I've said, not only the power, but then all of these other energy uh, solutions. It's like electric cars. I mean, you're just transferring the, I mean, if you're charging your car from a, from a, fission, from a uh, fossil fuel source, you're just transferring the problem. You're not solving the problem. So that's terawatts, terawatt hours of, of new power. Mm. 50 terawatt hours of new power would conceivably be needed in, in Australia to charge electric vehicles if we go very, very hard electric. That is a lot of new power, even for a new nuclear sector on its own, mm -hmm. let alone to try to achieve it without one. So again, it's a question of scale. Um, one way we looked at it with, for example, the hydrogen uh, as a thing. Uh, Australia's got heaps of energy security. Uh, one thing we don't have a lot of onshore is our own oil. We're an oil importer. Mm. We are about 2,600 petajoules of oil in a year we import into Australia. To make, if, if we committed every uh, megawatt hour of all wind and all solar production in Australia, I don't, I don't mean the excess or what's available in cheap hours, I mean the whole sector, if that was wholly committed to making hydrogen, we'd make about 3% of that energy in the oil from the entire sector is worth 3% of that oil in hydrogen. So let's say really optimistically, we were able to electrify everything but 5% of that oil. But for that last thing, for certain purposes, we need some liquid fuels. We would need a whole new renewable sector of Australia, larger than the one we've got today, just to do that job. So again, we've got to grab this problem hard and go long-term and big. Um, net zero isn't a finish line. It's a, sort of, it's a condition that we've got to meet and then maintain. Mm -hmm. 
forever. Then go backwards. Yeah, yeah. and then go forever. <laughs> it, it's, yeah, we don't sort of, you know, charge over the, the finish line, you know, pop the champagne and, and say we've won. We made it's, it. <laughs> it's, it's the way we, we have to operate then forever after. Um, so that's, we need to get all of that technology on the table. And it's not going to be easy. You know, we're, no. addic we're addicted to oil. No, yeah. we're addicted to coal. Um, so yeah. the transition is, yeah, it's not going to be easy. And, and there will be some sectors that may want to go back, just like when you try and cut out your sugar from your diet, you know, mm -hmm. that's hard. And you slip up and you go back. So, mm. you know, it's not, it's not going to be an easy transition, but we can do it. And is there opportunity there? There might be. We could, yeah. South Australia itself might need only a limited number of these devices in its partic particular mix, but we could mm -hmm. manufacture them. We could do a really good job of manufacturing those devices for the rest of Australia and the rest of Southeast Asia. It's a question of where is our opportunity in the whole big picture in the whole world? What's, what is our little curious state that can be that right-sized state sometimes yep. for getting something done? Is there an opportunity there? I think there is. Yeah. And the big ex big opportunity is also exporting energy to the world, be it in Absolutely. hydrogen cells or whatever. So mm -hmm. um, we have got the, the, you know, the land mass for the solar and we can get it into battery and, and be exporting to countries like Japan. That's, that's a big opportunity. So we're already, you know, flowing some of our renewable energy into state, but let's think globally as well. Let's be a, an exporter. It could, be, it could be our biggest export market. What's the biggest hurdle when it comes to pushing forward and, you know, actually achieving some of these broad and big goals, pushing environment and climate change to the top of the agenda? Well, I think, here you had it mm -hmm. with the social license. I think that's our biggest impediment. Well, combined with legislation, which is mm -hmm. an expression of social license, let's mm -hmm. face it. Uh, but if we don't, if we don't get really sort of broad scale behavior intervention, and I don't mean manipulation, and that's what the you know the marketers do, and that's what the uh, the uh, political strategists do for politicians, is they try to manipulate societal behavior towards their particular outcomes, the, the, their desired outcomes. But we need, you know, the UK had a, um, had, emphasis on the word had, a uh, behavior intervention committee that was independent from the ruling government that would give uh, advice about how to promote large scale sustainable decisions among the populace. The, the Americans had another one, I can't remember exactly their names, but they were disbanded and defunded. Uh, but having these kind of pe people who understand psychology and behavior and they can pu push these out. I mean, we've done it at individual level with, you know, contraception use, mm -hmm. energy use, water use. We've done it at the societal level, even things like, um, you know, opt in versus opt out options uh, for think everything from energy use to water use uh, or uh, things like um, tax uh, compliance and various other components. We can move society towards broad scale acceptance of these larger requirements, but you need to understand the human mind to do that. And that's, you know, that's out of my field. <laughs> Is it in yours, Laura? Uh, which, which, which sort of um, behavioral change and trying to get people? Yeah, behavioral change for sure. So I, um, I obviously wear two hats. I work in industry as a senior sustainability consultant with GHD, but I also do a lot of outreach work um, by my own and have my obviously my eco chat podcast where and uh, so online sustainability programs where I really try and encourage people to change their behaviors so yeah yes it, it, it is mine it all links back to um, for people to change they need to want to change but people need to to value and it comes back to that valuing our environment valuing our natural spaces and having that strong connection to to, to the environment as well. And I've often been asked, like, Laura, why are you so passionate about sustainability and environment? You know, it's been a thing I've been passionate about my entire life. And it comes back to my, my childhood was spent outdoors. Um, and I was a girl guide, I did a lot of camping, a um, lot of outdoors. I loved the natural environment. I lived, I grew up in, in, in Gippsland, um, all around the, in a town called Sale with beautiful wetlands. The, the 90 mile beach wasn't far away. We were stones throw from the mountains. So lots of time outside, strong connection to nature. And um, we, I find the people who have that strong connection to nature uh, value the environment more. And then they're more inclined to make the changes to protect it. Mm -hmm. So I think 
if we can connect the wider population more to the um, more to nature and if it's not getting people out of the cities bringing the nature into the cities and I know there's plans for you know Adelaide to become a national park city and things like that actions like that will help yeah, people yeah, there are value proposals the to develop the more. green belt <laughs> yeah so yes I think um, you know, I've got a lot to say on changing our behaviors but it does come back to we need to value our environment for the value of our environment of just of, of just valuing nature, not looking at as nature as always something that we need to extract from and something yeah. that's product, productive. What's a productive productivity um, value of that area? We yeah. need to just value it as just being that area. Yeah, I agree with that. I, yeah. I, I think we sometimes, we, we miss having a, a positive vision that we can um, all actually understand that we're going towards something good. I, I think that tends to motivate a slightly more coordinated action mm -hmm. is we can sort of pull together in the same direction. Um, when we're a bit worried about things, we can duck and run and scatter and we yeah. get a little, yeah. little stressed. Um, so like two, two, two or three examples, uh, you know, I've, I've, I live around this sort of um, inner south around the, the Mitcham kind of area. I, I grew up there, I've left, I've come back, but I've watched it now for about 40 years. It's actually greener than it was from street trees. So, you know, Adelaide at large is greener. Like back in the 80s, God, it was hot going for a walk to the shops, yeah. right? Because there was no shade. And now there is. We do have the ability to change the world around us for the better. We have demonstrated it amply. So if I could have a vision that, you know, I know I can go snorkeling off in Adelaide Beach and I'll see lots of fish. Mm -hmm. Oh, that'd be good. That would be great. Well, what, what do we need to do for me to be able to see lots of fish? We've got to clean the waterways. We've got to protect this, this habitat. We've got to manage our fisheries in this way. Um, where's the pull factor towards something positive? Um, why can't Kangaroo Island be a totally feral eradicated island that is an, you know, an exemplar of, of Australian bush? Um, where, where are those visions for what you might see when you, when you go out in, into SA? What about clean air? I think that's one reason electric vehicles excite people a lot. Yeah, you can't wait. To I know, me too. <laughs> Don't have the because smell. I think, yeah, because I think we're all quite connected to the fact that those tailpipes suck. You know, there's nothing good about these. Yeah, we have some of the cleanest air in the world. I know, yeah. I know. That's and, one of the reasons I live in Adelaide and not Melbourne. And we want more, <laughs> damn it. Cleaner, yeah. more, better, right? It, so we, we, we can all intuit that a world without tailpipes will be a better place wow. to live and grow up. And we really grow towards that. And a healthier place. Yes. You know, like, you know, your asthma and all these other conditions will go down as well. So. Yeah. So I think we need, yeah. to t need to establish ourselves where we're going and why. What's in it for us? What's in it for your kids if we, if we embark on these programs that, that, might, that might take this long? Well, everyone has skin in the game. And that's yeah. the thing is that there's a bit of a fallacy that there's a trade-off between environmental improvement yeah. and economic prosperity. And that's, frankly, that's bullshit. That's... Mm -hmm everyone is going to benefit from even things like reduced population size is going to have fewer, fewer pressures on real estate. Uh, it's gonna have fewer pressures on public transport. I mean, these are, it, it's anathema to the economists stuck in the, you know, we must have, uh, we must have economic growth that's me measured in GDP, which is basically just the speedometer of economic transactions. We can have a more steady state economy with a stable population and everyone benefits from improving those environmental conditions. I love that. It's having a concept of equilibrium. Mm. So why do, why, why do we always have to be growing? We don't. That's just that human greed. Well, yeah. yes, and that's also, again, some of the corporate stranglehold on our political <laughs> systems, but yeah. you know, more, more consumers means more profit. Exactly. But it, we don't need that. Mm -hmm. So how do we maintain hope for the future. Do you, do you still have, all have hope? I have lots of hope and I have lots of hope because I see the younger generations coming through who are educated and they're passionate and they're, they're demanding more. They're having that courage to challenge. As, as I said, like when I went through uni that 25 or so years ago, I was one of a small group of, of graduates and we were in a small, like a small number of environmental professionals in Australia. That, that number's blossomed, it's bloomed. And it's not just that profession anymore. It's intertwined in every profession as we've already spoken. So it's becoming a way of life. It will continue to become a way of life. And more and more people are advocating and stepping up for the environment from all generations. So that gives me a lot of hope. I, it, I no longer have to think, gosh, it all has to be up to me. You know, when I probably have been that workaholic my entire career, you know, driven by that passion. It's like, Laura, just slow down now because Jane's going to do some and Michael's going to run off with it and, you know, let them do it. Mm -hmm. So, and Kira? 
Yeah. yeah, certainly. I think for me, it's about celebrating the little wins. Um, and every day um, when I have um, clients coming to me um, with these plans for these innovative projects that are just going to be doing really great things for the state, for the community, for Australia, um, and we work through processes and we start seeing them built. And, you know, every morning over breakfast when I open the advertiser and I can see a story about a project um, or someone who is doing something new and willing to try doing something different um, to see if we can do it better. That's what gives me hope that, that there is a, so many people out there that are just every day chipping away. And as long as we keep doing that, there's a way forward. All right. I think I'm, I'm getting the wind up. Any quick <laughs> last comments? From yeah, I'll say quickly on, on that topic. I, I had a, um, a thought bubble on Twitter the other day, which I put out there. I got some nice warm responses when I, I talked about um, grieve, work, celebrate. Um, we've got to do all of them, but never at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, when, we, when we start pushing all of those things together, we won't do any, any of them properly. And I know grief is a strong word, but my friend Corey here once told me, Jarvan Rhino, forget about it, Ben, right? It, it's not going to happen. That's, it's going to go extinct. And I'm like, oh, wow. Okay. That's, I'll never see one in the wild, basically. Is that what you're telling me? There's a grief in that, I think. Mm. We've got to feel it. Um, but then you've got to work. Um, and you've got to get into a different mindset for your work. And then you've got to remember to celebrate. And then and maybe you can save the white rhino. And then maybe you can <laughs> Exactly. That's yeah. exactly right. And then you've got to remember to celebrate. You know, if there's a birthday, celebrate it. Um, we, if we if, do all those things, focus on, on those positives mm. and go there. Um, but that sort of helps me keep, keep that hope. Okay. Well, a big thank you to the panel and thanks to the audience for joining us. And to keep the conversation going, use the hashtag Fearless Conversations on Twitter and we'll have more on this subject in tomorrow's advertiser and this weekend's Sunday Mail. So get out and explore our environment, celebrate, dip into the Nature Festival. We're halfway through in Adelaide and South Australia this week and have a great day. Thanks. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you.